Shalom, welcome back. We're continuing on with this study of Luke's secret code, the Pythagorean connection in Luke Acts. Like we said last time, the point is not that it's a Pythagorean connection. The point is that it's really the Essene connection. Because Josephus, there's two different statements made by Josephus that are key. One is that Pythagoras learned his doctrine, learned basically everything he knew from Jews living in Egypt. And I would add, also, he was in Babylon for a while at the same time, um, roughly the same time Daniel was. So depending on exactly when Daniel was there and exactly when Pythagoras was there, they could have even um, met each other and known each other. Um, there's, a, there's you know different timelines on the two of them, and um, it could be that Pythagoras came to Babylon after Daniel, but... Um, but you know they're they're both roughly in the same time period, and so there, he also makes another statement in another place that the Pythagoreans and the Essenes lived the same manner of life. So that kind of clears up what kind of Jews exactly it was that Pythagoras was interacting with. That it was obviously Essenes in Egypt, and even if you read. Um, Josephus's account of the translation of the Septuagint where these elders from Jerusalem go to Egypt and they make the translation um, a lot of what he talks about as far as their practices and their manner of life while they were in Egypt uh, it sounds very similar to um, to what we know about Essene lifestyles so uh, like I said before in the other videos I'm not getting all this from my own discovery. This comes from a couple of books written by this lady, Paula Gott. Books are on the screen. You can read the entire Plutarch's Parable book at the address at the bottom of the screen, and that same website also has some uh, sample chapters from Gabriel's Gift. And then this other book, Dimensions of Paradise, goes into the numbers that we talked about at the, uh, in the first several videos. Uh, again, this is not you know a Christian book. This is uh, this got a lot of the Christian um, you know numerology or whatever, but it's also got a lot of occultic stuff in it too. So if you check the book out, at least be aware of that. Um, you know, you have to use your own discernment. Don't go believe in everything that's said. So why did the Essenes or uh, you know the Pythagoreans or whoever? You know, why were they interested in numbers? Well, it wasn't because they were worshiping the numbers. It's because they believe that by picking up on these different codes and patterns in creation that it revealed things about the creator. Um, so like the uh, Fibonacci sequence, which is the, uh, the pattern that you see in things like seashells, like that's, that's an example of something that you see a repetitive code or mathematical equation in nature. And so that's the kind of thing that these um, Essenes or Pythagoreans that they that's why the numbers were significant to them so we looked at the numbers in Luke and now that we've got somewhat of an understanding about that let's look at some of the uh, the other enigmas and what may be being communicated by Luke in the opening chapters because if he was going to put a, a code in his book if he, if he was going to turn his book essentially into a a mystery novel that you have to decipher you would expect him right off the bat to reveal this to us so let's turn back to the first chapter and the first chapter is all about the um the birth and the events prior to the birth of john the baptist and it says that um this messenger when he appeared to Zechariah, he says about John the Baptist that he shall be great before Yahuwah and drink no wine or strong drink at all. Well, right off the bat, if you're a student of Scripture, you know that we can turn back to Numbers chapter 6, and it speaks about this Nazarite vow, which uses the same language, that if you take a vow of a Nazarite, you separate yourself from wine and strong drink. Also, a razor doesn't come up on your head, and you shall let the locks of your hair grow long. Well, okay, you think about long hair, the first thing that you 
probably think about is Samson. So then we turn to prior to the birth of Samson, and again, the same admonition is given to the mother of Samson by the angel. Do not uh, drink wine or strong drink or eat un- any unclean food, for look, your son uh, will be a Nazarite from birth. And so this is actually repeated twice. After the angel says it, then the woman goes to her husband and repeats the same words, that he's going to be a a Nazarite from birth to death. So there is a connection, and the connection is really strong between uh, Judges 13 and then what we see in Luke um, being said about John the Baptist. And in fact, the opening statement is, there was a certain man from Zorah of the clan of the Danites whose name was Manawah, his wife was barren, and a messenger of Yahuwah appeared. Well, so we go from the um, the details about the family line of this man named Manawah, goes on to his wife being barren, and then this messenger appears. In the story given in Luke, it goes into the lineage of Zechariah. He's of the division of Abiyah. And, of course, it also gives his wife's lineage. They had no child because Elisheba, or Elizabeth, was barren. And then the messenger appears. So, again, you see this same pattern. And, in fact, if you read the entire stories, they're basically the same story. The only thing really missing is that the child will be called a Nazarite. So why is, why is the Nazarite part left out of the story of John the Baptist? You know, why is that statement not made well before we can even answer that question we look over our list of enigmas and number 19 is a noteworthy omission so the omission of this term Nazarite itself is noteworthy and and so now we've triggered one of these enigmas now one thing I was surprised about the, the name of the angel is actually given in Luke. In the story of Samson, the angel is not named. In fact, the woman even asks for the name of the angel, and he refuses to give it. So, this angel Gabriel that's appearing to Zechariah, as much as we talk about the angel Gabriel, he's really only mentioned four times in all of Scripture. Uh, twice he's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. He appeared to Zechariah, and then he also appears to Miriam, the mother of Yeshua. And in Daniel, he's mentioned twice. He's uh, seen in a vision by Daniel, and um, and then he actually appears to Daniel. So there seems to be a connection between Luke and Daniel with this naming of the angel. Oddly enough, there's also another connection with the book of Daniel because it says in chapter 1 that Daniel laid it upon his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the sovereign's food nor with the wine. So speaking about abstaining from certain foods and wine, we see that again in Daniel. And Daniel says, give us vegetables to eat and water to drink, which is essentially what is said by people like Epiphanius about the Ebionites is that they only ate vegetables and drank water. They wouldn't even drink uh, wine. Um, I've also made the the point that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they talk about new wine, which is basically grape juice. It's not fermented wine. And uh, I think the connection there is, you know, it could be alcohol content, but I really think that the, uh, the reason that they would only drink new wine or you know unfermented wine was because wine itself was fermented in the skin of a dead animal so if you're you know if if you were a vegan or vegetarian could you imagine drinking grape juice out of the body of a dead animal i mean to me that's repulsive and i think to anyone that's uh, vegetarian or vegan that it would be repulsive to them also and so that would explain why Uh, These Ebionites and the Essenes and the Nazarites would would, would not partake of wine. It 
I don't think it had anything to do with the alcohol content. You know, that's what we as modern men and women, you know, raised in the church, that's what we focus on as being the evil of wine. But I, I think it wasn't the alcohol. I think it was the, um, the you know, fact that it would have been defiled by uh, a dead body. And keep in mind that when we look at people like um, Samson or John the Baptist, if they were Nazarites, they were Nazarites from the womb. They were lifelong Nazarites. And that's really what I think that the Nazareans were. Uh, in, in addition to the fact that they're, the names are phonetically similar, um, the, the Nazarites or Nazareans would have been lifelong Nazarites. So, why were we to leave off the, the title Nazarite? Why was it um, omitted from the first chapter of Luke? I believe that the author may be trying to reveal something to us here, in, uh, starting at verse 20, when the angel tells Zechariah that he's not going to be able to speak until the child is born. And it's kind of unusual, you know, the, he was... Zechariah was dumbfounded by this angel's promise in the same way that Abraham was about Isaac. And that that's really, I think, a reasonable reaction. But this angel seems to be offended by the fact that Zechariah didn't believe him. And to me, this was unusual given how many other times we've seen this in the scripture and never has the recipient of the message been str uh, stricken dumb for being told that a son was going to be born to him. And it says that when he came out, when he came out of the temple, he was unable to speak to them. And they recognized he had seen a vision in the dwelling place, for he was beckoning to them and remained dumb. So if you're beckoning, you're trying to convey a message by using nonverbal means. So you're you know, motioning with your hands or whatever you need to do to try and convey the message, but you're not able to speak the message. And maybe that's, maybe the author of Luke is telling us that that's what he's going through, that the author of Luke is unable to just tell us in plain words what's being said, but he's got to motion them to us. He's got to give us signals. There's a couple of names mentioned at the beginning of uh, this first chapter of Luke. It says that um, a certain priest named Zechariah of the di division of Abiyah, now, these two names only appear in the same verse one other time in Scripture, and that's at Second Chronicles 29, where, speaking of Hezekiah, it says that his mother's name was Abiyah, the daughter of Zechariah. And the following verse on both of these statements are relatively similar. I mean, they're basically the same idea when speaking of Hezekiah says, and he did what was right in the eyes of Yahuwah according to all that his father David did. But then when it speaks about Zechariah and his wife, it says they were both righteous before Elohim, blamelessly walking in all the commandments and the, or and the righteousness of Yahuwah. So you, these two statements, it's not just that the names are the same, it's that the statements are strikingly similar. And that perhaps maybe this is another one of these enigmas that we're supposed to be investigating you know can we can we find any other meaning within the second chronicles that is being connected to luke and so if we look further in second chronicles 29 it speaks about hezekiah pulling all these levites together and he says to them listen to me O levites so he's getting their attention there's something that he wants to convey our fathers have trespassed and done evil in the eyes of yahuwah and they have shut the doors, and then we put out the lamps, and see this, our fathers have fallen by the swords, and our wives are in captivity for this. So the message is, at least from what I can discern out of it, is that there's trespass in the land, is specifically connected to the priests, and this kind of brings to mind Yeshua going into the temple in all four of the Gospels and what's called the cleansing of the temple where he drives out the animals being sacrificed and the people that are selling them. 
And and I believe it's actually in Luke where he says that Yeshua refused to let anyone carry anything into the temple after that. In fact, it was the priests that Yeshua really seemed to have a problem with, and it was the priests that orchestrated the uh, murder of Yeshua. So I think one message is, is that the priests are doing wickedness. But then when it talks about shutting the doors to the temple... There's an event that Luke writes about later in the book of Acts that involves a shutting of the doors of the temple. And I think we're going to get to that later. But then he mentions that our fathers have fallen by the sword and we're being led into captivity because of this. So perhaps the reason he's not able to speak about the Nazarite is because something is going on with the Nazareans and they are being killed by the sword, and led into captivity. And then if we turn back to Luke, after the birth of John the Baptist, when Zechariah is given the ability to speak again, the words that he says seems to reinforce this theory that I'm putting forward, that that they were being oppressed and that they were being kept silent. When uh, when his voice is restored, Zechariah says, Blessed be Yahuwah Elohim of Israel, for he did look upon and worked redemption for his people and it raised up a horn of deliverance and deliverance from our enemies and from the hand of those hating us delivered from the hand of our enemies to serve him without fear so again there's a lot of language in these verses about um, giving them freedom from oppression which again seems to indicate that there is some sort of oppression going on um, you know, he, speaking about John giving the knowledge of deliverance and to give light, remember the coded numbers for light that we saw earlier, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. So my, my thoughts, my impression after reading these clues that Luke is giving us, I think that the reason that the information about John being a Nazarite was left out was because there was some sort of um, oppression, some sort of uh, war, maybe an information war, maybe a literal war being waged against Luke and the members of his sect that are writing this book and that they are having to speak in a coded language using signals instead of words in order to either protect themselves or to protect the message. So, and as we get into this a little deeper, I think Luke even names the party responsible by name. So, um, so we'll get into that in upcoming parts to the series. I thank you for listening. Shalom.